Chapter 9 Pumps, Pump Accessories, and Drafting Operations. Basically, in this chapter, we're going to kind of step back from figuring hydraulics and do a little bit more of understanding our pump and how it works. Your objectives define a main pump, explore the various parts of the pump rating system, discuss the theory of determining a pump's capacity. Explain how booster pumps are used. Discuss the purpose of priming pumps and explain the theory of positive displacement pumps. Explain the theoretical discharge of a positive displacement pump. List the various types of positive displacement pumps presently used in the fire service. Discuss the difference between a rotary gear, a rotary lobe, and a rotary vein pump. Explain how a centrifuge pump works. Explain how a multi-stage centrifugal pump works when in series and when in parallel. Define cavitation and identify some of the signs of cavitation. Explain why a pump overheats and how to eliminate the problem. Identify the various parts of the monthly test of a pump. Explain the various parts of an annual service test of a pump. Discuss what should be located on a pump operating panel and whether it is normally located. Explain some of the safety factors associated with the operation of a pump panel. And demonstrate how a relief valve works. Discuss the purpose of having a suction relief valve on an apparatus. Explain how a pressure governor works. Explain the advantages of having flow meters on an apparatus. Discuss the differences between an intake gauge and a discharge gauge and how the gauges work. Identify some of the safety gauges installed on an apparatus pump panel. Discuss the differences between absolute and relative pressure. Determine the pressure reduction within a pump by reading the number of inches on, of mercury on the compound gauge. Explain the principles of lifting water when drafting. Determine approximately how high water can be lifted by reading the number of inches of mercury on the compound gauge. Determine the number of inches of mercury required on the compound gauge in order to lift water a given distance. And explain the effects of altitude and weather on drafting operations. Determine the net pump pressure when taking water from a hydrant or when conducting drafting operations. Outline the steps required when conducting drafting operations and explain how to set up drafting operations from a broken connection. This chapter covers the types of pumps that are used in the fire service. The three types of pumps that are discussed are the main pumps, the priming pumps, and the booster pumps. Some types are used more than others depending on when they were manufactured. A main pump is a centrifuge pump having a capacity of 500 gallons per minute or more. A centrifugal pump operates by converting kinetic energy into velocity and pressure energy. Main pumps normally depend on water from the water mains within a community and from auxiliary water supply systems when drafting operations are required. A main pump may be a single stage pump or a multi stage pump. A single stage centrifuge pump consists of a single impeller mounted on a shaft and enclosed in a pump housing. The multi-stage centrifugal pump has two impellers mounted on a single shaft and enclosed in the pump housing. Here's a photo of a single stage pump. Notice that this is a centrifugal type because you can see the veins here, the impeller. Most main pumps are now single stage centrifuge type pumps. Single stage pumps are able to put out 2,000 gallons per minute, but are limited in pressure, usually up to 300 psi. When more than 300 psi is needed, a multi stage pump must be used. Some high rise buildings require the higher pressure to account for the back pressure. Pumps are rated for a certain GPM by the manufacturer. Pumps are rated into three different pressures. Their capacity test is at 150 PSI where the pump is going to pump its maximum gallons per minute. Then you have 70% of capacity which is at 250 P, uh, 200 PSI 
in the 50% capacity at 250 PSI. An example is what occurs with a 1500 gallon per minute pump rated at 150 PSI. As the net pump pressure is increased to 200 PSI and 250 PSI, a 100% capacity would be 1500 gallons per minute at 150 PSI net pump pressure. 70% capacity would be 1050 at 200 PSI net pump pressure, and the 50% capacity would be 750 gallons per minute at 250 PSI net pump pressure. The term net pump pressure refers to the actual pressure produced by the pump. When the pumper is connected to a positive pressure source, the net pump pressure is the difference between the discharge pressure and the incoming pressure. For example, if the incoming pressure supplied by the hydrant is 40 psi and the discharge pressure from the pump is 160 psi, the net pump pressure is 120 psi. Theoretical pump capacity. A pump is like an engine. It has the ability to do just so much work and no more. The work capacity of a pump is expressed in pounds and gallons. The number of pounds and gallons is determined by multiplying the rated capacity of the pump by its rate of pressure. This means that theoretically, whenever the pump is operated at a net pump pressure above 150 psi, the result is a reduction in the amount of water discharged. Exceeding the pump capacity does not normally present a problem in the day-to-day -day operations of most fire departments. When these situations do exist, however, a thorough knowledge of pump limitations is required. The limitation of a pump is most likely to be challenged when a master stream has been placed into operation. It should be apparent from a quick glance at the rating that less water can be discharged by a pump whenever the net pump pressure exceeds 150 psi than when net pump pressure is kept at the 150 psi or less. Knowing when the pump limitations has been reached requires a thorough understanding of the basic concepts of your pump's capability. Booster pumps may be of the centrifuge or positive displacement type and have the capacity of less than 500 gallons per minute. They are used to supply smaller lines, particularly pre-connect lines. Booster pumps generally receive the water from a water tank carried on the apparatus. Most apparatus that have been in service for a while utilize centrifugal booster pumps rather than positive displacement pumps. Priming pumps are used to prime or remove the air from the main pump. Priming pumps are of the positive displacement type. Positive displacement means that they can pump air as well as water. Centrifugal pumps are non-positive pumps. They can only pump liquids and not air. The text provides an example of how a positive displacement pump works. A two-stroke engine is used to demonstrate. For every stroke, a certain amount of air is moved. Using the piston type of positive pressure pump as an illustration, the theoretical discharge of a one-cylinder pump would be equal to the amount of water contained in the cylinder from TDC to BDC. However, the theoretical discharge is never achieved during pumping operations. Here's a demonstration of the principle of the piston pump. This is due to two primary causes. The pressure buildup develops a back pressure against the pump which forces some of the discharge from the discharge side of the pump back to the suction side. There is also a certain amount of leakage of water through the pump clearance as the piston moves up and down. There are three different types of positive displacement pumps currently in use on older fire apparatus still in service. The rotary gear pump, the load pump, and the vane pumps. Most of the newer apparatus use vane or rotary lobe pumps. Rotary gear pumps. Rotary gear pumps consist of two gears that intermesh and turn in opposite directions. Rotary gear pumps are capable of moving air as well as water. 
The air enters the pump on the intake side. It is trapped between the teeth as the pump rotates and is discharged out of the pump on the discharge side. Rotary lobe or cam pumps can be seen in figure 9-7. The principle of operation of a rotary low pump is similar to that of a rotary gear pump. Air or water enters the pump. It is trapped between the lobes as they turn. It is released as the lobes containing the trapped material reaches the discharge side of the pump. Rotary vane pumps. The rotary vane pumps consist of a single rotary within the pump casing that turns eccentric to the casing. When the rotaries are located, four slots, each of which contain identical veins that are free to move within the slots as the rotary turns. As they move, the vein maintains contact with the surface of the casing. So as seen here, it comes in, it spins around, and it's forced out of the pump. The space between two adjacent veins is at a minimum when the first vein passes the discharge port. The trapped air water will move along the casing wall toward the discharge outlet as the rotor continues to turn. The space between the two veins will begin to decrease as the air or water is forced out of the discharge outlet. A number of the major pump manufacturers utilize the rotary vein pump as their priming pump. The principles of how a centrifuge pump works can best be demonstrated by considering a bucket of water. If the bucket is picked up and swung around in a circle, it will appear that the water increases in weight as the speed of the rotation increases. The principle involved can further be examined by poking a hole in the bottom of the bucket. The faster the bucket is swung, the greater the discharge will be, and the farther the water will be discharged from the hole. This force is referred to as centrifugal force. Here is a picture of an impeller that is commonly seen in a centrifugal pump. Principles of operation. There are two main parts of a centrifugal pump, the impeller and the volute. The impeller rotates on a shaft inside the volute, which creates a centrifugal force. The force hurls the water from the eye of the impeller out to the discharge. Multi-stage pumps. If more water or pressure is needed, then can be produced from a pump with a single impeller. A multi-stage pump is used. These pumps have two or more impellers that rotate off a common shaft. Each impeller has its own volute. This type of pump can create either a lot of pressure or a lot of volume, but not both. A transfer valve can direct water from the first impeller either into the second impeller or out the discharge. When the transfer valve is in the volume or parallel position, the water enters each impeller's eye from a common intake and leads through a common pump discharge. If the transfer valve is turned to the pressure series position, the first stage pump its full volume and pressure directly to the second stage intake instead of to the pump discharge. The second stage then pumps this same volume of water to the pump discharge, but at twice the first stage pressure. Essentially, the first one speeds it up, and then the second one takes that pressure because it's already speeds it up and then speeds it up even more. Centrifuge pumps can take advantage of the incoming pressure. This pressure can be the, from a hydrant or another pump. If the first impeller makes 50 psi, then the second impeller will receive that 50 psi. With the incoming 50 psi, the second impeller will make 50 psi for a total of 100 psi. Volume mode gets lots of water. Pressure mode gets lots of pressure. The two-stage series parallel pump has long been the standard for use in the fire service. This pump provides a wide range of capacity over a range of pressures, roughly twice as wide as is possible with a single-stage pump.
These pumps can grade pressures up to 500 PSI, while a single stage pump is usually limited to 300 PSI. In order to use a series parallel pump to best advantage, the operator must know when to use each mode. Generally, if you need 50% or more capacity and a pressure of 200 PSI or less, use the volume mode. If the pressures are needed are over 200 PSI, the series mode should be used. Cavitation. Any liquid at any temperature forms a vapor over the surface, which produces a certain amount of pressure. When the vapor pressure is equal to or greater than the pressure surrounding the liquid, the liquid will boil. It is important to understand that we can make this happen inside the pump as it can create damage to the pump and possibly disrupt the supply to the nozzle. By operating the pump at too high a speed, restricting the intake, or several other reasons, the pressure around the liquid will fall below its vapor pressure. This is called cavitation. Air bubbles are formed that collapse in the high pressure area of the pump. You can think of it as trying to push more water out of the discharge than is coming in the intake. Signs of cavitation. Sudden pressure or capacity loss. Increased pump speed without a corresponding increase in volume or pressure. Excessive pump vibration. A rattling sound resembling gravel going through the pump. This is an important reason to watch the gauges in the pump panel and listen to the sound of the engine. Let's say you're beginning to flow your dead gun with a 2 inch tip at 80 psi. That is right at 1000 gallons per minute. As you get to about 60 psi on the discharge gauge, you continue to throttle up with no increase in pressure. You've run out of water because the supply you have is not enough to supply what you need. Overheating. If the pump runs even for a few minutes completely closed, it may heat the water enough to scald someone when the valve is open. Overheating can damage the packing seals and other pump parts. Fresh water needs to be run through the pump to keep it cool at all times. Usually a discharge is open to let the water flow. Most new pumps will have a valve for just this purpose. Inspection test. There are several types of inspections that will be reviewed in the next section. Inspection of the pump should be performed on a regular basis. Through checks should be formed monthly and annually. Because of its high importance, the annual test will be reviewed in depth. Some of our monthly tests. For the vacuum test, remove all caps except in the opening without valves. Close all discharges, intake, and train valves and other similar openings. Operate the priming device until 22 millimeters mercury is pulled or 30 seconds, whichever comes first. Shut down the priming device. There should be no more than a 10 degree drop in 5 minutes. For the pressure test, hook the supply line up to a hydrant or other pressurized source. Remove all caps except those with no valves. Close all discharges. Open the intake valve to the pump. Crack the highest discharge and bleed out the air. Listen and look for leaks. For the running test, set up for a drafting operation if possible get water flowing within the allotted time. Operate all engine driven devices and flow water for at least 15 minutes checking for consistency in pump performance. Annual test. At least once a year pumps should be tested according to NFPA 1911. Performance testing of fire pumps and industrial supply pumps. The results of these tests should be compared to those of previous tests. If the result differs from the previous test results, problems can be identified and corrected. Almost every fire department conducts an annual test that conforms with the recommendations of NFPA 1911. The test also meets the requirements of the Insurance Service Office ISO. 
which is the organization that conducts the inspection of a community to determine its fire protection capabilities. The surface test is conducted by the fire department annually and after any major repairs or modifications have been made to the pump or any components of the apparatus that is used to pump operations. It is desirable that all the apparatus operators who are responsible for operating the apparatus on a daily basis observe the testing procedures. The service test consists of a series of seven tests. Engine speed test, priming system test, vacuum test, pumping test, overload test, pressure control test, and the tank to pump flow rate. Engine speed test. All pumpers should have a governed speed that is set by the manufacturer. If the throttle is depressed fully to the ground, the engine speed should be governed. On the test plate at the pump panel, it will say what the governed speed should be. In this test, the current governed speed shall match the stamp governed speed with plus or minus 50 RPM. If the engine speed is not correct, the reason for the discrepancy shall be determined and corrected, and the engine shall be retested. Primary system test. This test ensures a pump can pull a draft, get the pump full of water, and discharge water at the nozzle in the allotted time. Pumps that are 1,250 gallons per minute or less must have water flowing within 30 seconds. Pumps with a capacity of 1,500 gallons per minute or more shall have water flowing within. 45 seconds. If the pump does not pass the test, it shall be inspected, repaired, and retested. Vacuum test. This test checks for air leaks in the hard suction hose, priming device, or the main pump. The procedure for the vacuum test is as follows. All intake valves shall be open, all intake plugged or capped and all discharge caps are moved with the valve in the closed position. The priming pump will be operated for 30 seconds or until a maximum vacuum of at least 22 millimeters of mercury is obtained. Record the reading on the vacuum gauge. The level of the gauge shall not drop more than 10 PSI in five minutes. When the time has started, the priming device shall not be used. The engine speed shall not be operated at any speed greater than the governed speed during this test. Pumping test. The object of this test is to determine the overall condition of both the pump and the engine. The pump shall be subjected to pumping tests consisting of the following. At least 20 minutes of pumping at 100% rate of capacity at a net pump pressure of 150 PSI. The overload test shall be performed immediately following this test of the pump at the rate of capacity at 150 PSI net pressure. The test is 5 minutes of pumping 100% capacity at a net pump pressure of 165 PSI. The 70% capacity test. This test is at least 10 minutes of pumping at 70% rate of capacity at a net pump discharge pressure of 200 PSI. The 50% capacity test. This test is at least 10 minutes of pumping at 50% rate of capacity at a net pump pressure of 250 PSI. If the pump is a two-stage parallel series type pump, the test at 100% of rate of capacity shall be run with the pump in the parallel mode. The test at 70% of the rate of capacity shall be permitted to run with a pump in either series or parallel mode. The test at 50% of rate of capacity shall be run with a pump in series mode. During the test, readings shall be taken and recorded at a minimum of every 5 minutes. So 5 readings during the 20 minute test three readings during the 10 minute test, and two readings during the five minute test. The pressure control test. This test is for the device that should control the pressure in case of a surge. There are two types that are currently in operation, 
a pressure relief valve, and a pressure governor. The pressure control device shall be tested with the following procedure. The pump shall be delivering the rated capacity at 150 PSI. The pressure control device shall be set according to the manufacturer's instructions to maintain the discharge pressure at 150 PSI net pump pressure. The pressure control device shall be tested with the following procedure. All discharge valves shall be closed, no more rapidly than 3 seconds and no more than slowly than 10 seconds. The rise in the discharge shall not exceed 30 PSI. Next, we test the relief valve at 90 PSI. Set the pump to 100% capacity at 150 PSI. Bring the pressure down to 90 PSI with the throttle. Don't change any of the discharge valve settings. Set the pressure relief valve device to 90 PSI. Close all the valves no more rapidly than 3 seconds and no more slowly than 10 seconds. The rise in discharge pressure shall not exceed 30 PSI. The test is done at 50% capacity at 250 PSI. Set the pump to deliver 50% capacity at 250 PSI net pump pressure. Then set the pressure control device at 250 PSI. All discharge valves shall be closed no more rapidly than 3 seconds and no more slowly than 10 seconds. The rise in pressure shall not exceed 30 PSI. Tank to pump flow rate. This test checks the piping between the onboard water tank and the main pump. The flow rate is specified by the manufacturer for a certain size pump. NPA 1901 also specifies the flow rate. Test procedure. The tank shall be filled until it overflows. All intakes to the pump shall be closed. The tank to fill and bypass cooling lines shall be closed. Connect the right amount of hose for the anticipated flow rate. The tank to pump valve and the discharge valves leading to the hose lines and nozzles shall be fully open. The engine throttle shall be adjusted to the maximum consistent pressure reading on the discharge pressure gauge is obtained. The discharge valve shall be closed and the water tank refilled. The discharge valve shall be reopened fully and a pitot reading or other flow measurements shall be taken while the water is being discharged. The flow rate shall be recorded and compared with the rate discharged by the manufacturer. The result of all tests should be recorded and compared with the test of previous tests to ensure consistency in the pump performance. The pump operator panel. The pump panel is the operating base for the pump operation. Almost everything that the pump operates has to do and provide and maintain effective fire streams that can be accomplished from the operating panel. The operator panel is normally a flat panel located on the driver's side of the apparatus, immediately behind the door to the cab. The location of the panel in this position has the disadvantage of the operator not having a constant view of the lines taken off the discharge outlets on the opposite side of the apparatus. Here is a picture of your standard pump panel. One advantage is protection from oncoming traffic if the panel is positioned adjacent to the curve. Pump accessories pressure and flow control devices. All pumpers that are frontline units will have two main gauges on the pump panel. One gauge is a compound gauge that will read between negative 30 to 600 PSI. The other gauge is the pressure gauge and will read between 0 and 600 PSI. Most discharges will each have their own pressure gauge by the valve. Here is a picture of a compound gauge. The main relief valve. Relief valves are used to control pressure surges in the lines. On centrifugal pumps, the relief valve discharges water from the discharge side of the pump to the intake side of the pump. Intake relief valve and main relief valves dump the water into the atmosphere, usually on the ground. 
Most fire department personnel are familiar with the way a simple spring-loaded relief valve works. It is presented here as a review for some and an introduction for others. With a spring-loaded relief valve, everything depends upon the force of the spring holding the valve in place. The text goes into more detail on the ways hydraulics can assist in the operating of the relief valve. Intake relief valves. These valves prevent excessive pressure from entering and damaging the pump. Some apparatus have built-in relief valves. The pressures are usually set in the field depending on the water supply. Water from the main relief valve is returned to the suction side of the pump while the relieved water from a suction relief valve is dumped to the ground. Pressure governors. Pressure governors work by controlling the RPM of the pump to keep the pressure at the desired setting. They are very effective in keeping the pressure constant, even with a large increase in intake pressure. They can either be set to maintain an RPM setting or a pressure setting. Flow meters. A flow meter is an instrument that measures the flow of liquid, gases, or vapors. A flow meter will tell the operator how much water has been pumped through the pump. It can also be attached to individual gauges if the apparatus is equipped with individual flow gauges for each of the outlets. If several lines are flowing, the operator only needs to know the tip size and the pressure. Most of the flow gauges being installed in apparatus today are of the digital type. There are some flow meters that provide the flow in digital formats and discharge pressure in the standard format. Pump intake and discharge gauges. There are two gauges on the pump panel that indicate what is coming into the pump and what is coming out. The compound gauge and the discharge gauge. Both gauges provide a reading relative to the atmospheric pressure. Both gauges are designed to read from 0 to at least 300 psi. The compound gauge also reads pressure below atmospheric pressure, which ranges from 0 to 30 inches of mercury. The compound gauge is calibrated to read both negative and positive pressures. The positive pressure is shown in pounds per square inch, while the negative pressure is shown in inches of mercury. It is important to remember that the reduction of atmospheric pressure is approximately one half psi for each thousand feet of elevation. For example, if an apparatus that normally operates at sea level is taken to an elevation of 5,000 feet, the reading on the intake gauge upon arrival will be approximately 5 inches of mercury. This fact must be taken into consideration if it is necessary to draft at this elevation. There are a number of things that can go wrong while an apparatus operator is supplying water for the working lines to the firefighters. When possible, it is a good idea to provide protection for the pump in regards to those things that can go wrong. There are products available for upgrading or refurbishing apparatus to improve safety and performance. Four that are presently available are dual shift alarms, overheat projection manager, large diameter slow close valve, and intake relief valves. Technology advances in the early 21st century have led to improved fire apparatus equipment. Digital gauges are being replaced by manual gauges. These gauges assist the operator in providing the correct amount of water at the nozzle. At the end of a fire, the operator can push a button to get the total gallons per minute run through the pump. Drafting operations. Drafting operations involve taking water from a source other than a pressurized hydrant. To successfully obtain water from these sources, a thorough knowledge of drafting principles and procedures is required. A basic understanding of pressure helps in understanding how the gauges work. Absolute and relative pressure. Absolute zero pressure refers to a complete absence of pressure or a perfect vacuum. Absolute pressure is the pressure above absolute zero and is identified as PSIG. 
Atmospheric pressure is measured in absolute pressure. Normal atmospheric pressure at sea level is 14.7. Gauge pressure is the pressure above atmospheric pressure and is identified as PSIG. At sea level, zero gauge pressure is an absolute pressure of 14.7. The zero reading on both types of gauges is gauge pressure, not absolute pressure. At sea level, for example, a gauge pressure of 50 psi would equal an absolute pressure of 64.7 psi. The reading below zero on the compound gauge are measured in inches of mercury. One inch of mercury is equal to an absolute pressure of 0.49 psi. An atmospheric pressure of 14.7 psi is equal to 29.92 inches of mercury. A pressure of 14.7 psi at the base of one square inch container will support a column of water approximately 33.9 feet high. Lift is the vertical distance from the surface of the water to the center of the pump when it is trapping. Theoretically, if a pump at sea level could produce a perfect vacuum, it could lift water to a height of 33.9 feet, hence the reason we went over all these measurements. However, no pump on a fire apparatus is capable of producing a perfect vacuum. If a pump is in excellent condition and drafting at sea level, it should be capable of obtaining a lift of 25 feet. The principle of lifting water. Water will move from one location to another whenever a difference of pressure exists between the locations and there is a clear path of travel between them. For drafting operations, the operator engages that priming pump. This will create a lower pressure inside the pump in the intake tube than is outside of the surface of the water. The difference in pressure will force the water up the intake and into the pump. With all the air removed from the main pump, the centrifuge pump will take over. The water will be ready at the discharge gates. No air can be let into the pump or will lose its prime. Theoretically, it might be desirable to know what reading is required in order to lift water to a given height. This information can be obtained by the following formula. Required Hg for mercury equals 0.885 h. So a 20 foot lift will require 17.7 mercury. Effects of altitude on drafting operations. For each thousand feet in elevation there is about a 0.5 reduction in atmospheric pressure increase or decrease in the baromatic pressure due to the movement of air masses will have the same effect on drafting ability of a pump as will a change in elevation. A pump operator on a clear day may be capable of lifting water one foot higher than it could on a rainy day. Net pump pressure is the amount of pressure actually being produced by the pump. The pump does just as much work while drafting as it does while forcing water to a height equivalent to the lift. When pumping from a hydrant, the pressure from the hydrant assists the pump. Drafting Procedures Before drafting operations begin, there are some important considerations to make. Make sure the ground is stable and won't become unstable because of the water runoff. It is best to be within 10 feet of the source in elevation. 20 feet should be considered as a max lift. At 20 feet lift, only 60% of the capacity can be expected. If pumping from a pool or similar source, remember the height of the water will decrease as it is pulled out. A strainer is in place at the end of the section of hard suction. The strainer must be at least 2 feet under the surface and at least 1 foot off the bottom. All drains, discharges, and intakes must be closed so that no air can get into the pump. When operating the priming pump, if there is no vacuum reading on the pump gauge, air is getting into the pump. 
allow water to flow out of the priming pump for 4 to 5 seconds. Throttle up the main pump to 100 PSI and open the discharge gates slowly. There will still be a vacuum reading on the compound gauge. Throttle up to the desired pressure. If you advance the throttle and there is no increase in pressure, you have reached the maximum volume for that pump. Throttle back down a little bit to prevent cavitation. A broken connection is one in which water is taken from a hydrant or other positive pressure source by water tenders at a remote location and discharged into an open container and then taken from that container by drafting operations. Essentially, it's what we call a water shuttle. Several possible makeshift reservoirs can be used for this type of operation. A hole can be dug in the ground and a salvage cover can be used as a lining. Several ladders can be used to form a basin with a salvage cover used for lining. Barrels if available can also be used. Drafting procedures with this type of operation are the same as routine drafting operations. Care must be taken to ensure that the makeshift reservoir is kept full so that the pump does not run away from the water. Care must also be taken that the line used to fill the makeshift reservoir is not directly at the strainer of the suction hose. Okay gang, you have got a lot to read and consider and questions to do for this chapter. Go ahead and get started on it. If you have any questions, you can call me in the office or email me at aroberts at athenstech.edu. Until next time, be safe and have a wonderful day.